And with Tom at the operational helm, he's realizing that within this niche hobby, there's a difficulty in finding other players. Um, you do have a small group of folks that are both interested in the history and the gameplay and the strategy, and he creates a play-by-mail, not email, play-by-mail system. There was no email. <laughs> so in follow-up question for Tom, I ask, finding someone to play Avalon Hill games with has always been tough. Tell us how you created the patented play-by-mail game system in 1964, and were you also behind the movement to create several solitaire game systems in the 80s? So Tom's response is, I edited the General Magazine for nine years. It was the linchpin to the creation of the play-by-mail system. In developing material for the general, I went into the testimonial files and, quote, hired those, who, those whose comments I felt would appeal to readers. Among them was Sergeant Lou Zachi. I hope I'm getting that right. I know Lou has actually designed some games. I would like to talk to him as well. Who became a lifelong contributor, which included freelance game design, Avalon Hills Luftwaffe, is one that comes to mind. The hirees were not paid. Happy to know they were part of Avalon Hill history. Definitely so. Right here, in fact. The back page of The General included opponents wanted ads, which led to my design of the play-by-mail system. This meant converting the six-digit die roll to a 10-digit combat results table. Battle results would be decided by stock market results, last sales digit being the die roll. Interesting. I do not recall any, quote, movement to create solitaire games in the 1980s, end quote. All right, I was definitely thinking B-17, Queen of the Skies, and then I was also thinking of everything Victory Games was doing, which is a subsidiary of Avalon Hill in the 80s, was solitaire games. But you've heard here from Tom, there wasn't any kind of concerted movement it makes me think that it's the designers just knowing the same, the feel of what's going on in, with gamers, and now a lot of them are playing solo, and so designers are submitting those designs. So, very, very interesting. Now, I remember back in my Avalon Hill days, 83, 84, 85, 6, 7, 8, and then 9, I'm kind of working and dating, but I remember Avalon Hill would put out, I remember vaguely different like puzzles and things. And so I knew they were putting other things out. Of course, if you're a company, you want to try to stretch, you know, a little bit and maybe you hit something that sells awesome. So case in point, Victory Games puts out their number one best-selling game of all time is Dr. Ruth's Game of Good Sex. Oh my, sold like 300, 400,000 copies. So you want to stretch and try some different things. But I had read where there was a lot of stuff that seems like it was just draining from Avalon Hill. Yeah, the Girl's Life magazine, which was successful in its own right, but that led off to a lot of kind of odd things and even some different directions. Now, no company's perfect, um, but I was curious kind of where some of that came from. I wasn't sure if, if uh, that's just a mix or is that something Eric Dot's doing? I didn't know. So I asked, or trying to figure out, I guess, I asked uh, Tom, please explain some of the Monarch Avalon Hill failures, such as occult kits, <laughs> puzzle sticks, those I remember, hide of baby dolls, and while not a failure, Girls Life magazine led to a teen girls camp, teen-themed restaurant, and a cigar store slash teen hangout. Now, a little tongue-in-cheek here. I then say, I suspect Jim Dunnigan has something to do with the last one. <laughs> so anybody that knows designer Jim Dunnigan, an author, 
he seems like he's always got a cigar in his mouth. So I'm thinking, well, maybe Jim's, you know, maybe there was some talk like, hey, we need to have a, uh, a teen hangout. And he's like, nah, we need a cigar store. Okay, combine the two. <laughs> so I don't know. But you'll see that referenced in the answer. So we'll, we'll go look and see what Tom says about uh, Dunnigan here real quick and uh, the teen-themed cigar store. Uh, there is no, for so again from Tom, there is no specific explanation regarding monarch failures. So I wasn't sure what kind of answer I was going to get here. I wasn't sure if I'd get a deep answer or something explaining, hey, we tried the Hyde adults. It didn't work. I don't know. Dot's decisions were much like that of a sole prop proprietorship, if I can get it out. Neither I nor Jim Dunnigan, as you mentioned, had anything to do with the diversifications you mentioned. So there you go. Tom had nothing to do with these different diversifications, nor did Jim Dunnigan. <laughs> so Jim did not have any input on the, the uh, cigar uh, store slash teen hangout. Um, but that alone tells you kind of what you need to know, I think, is that that's uh, Eric Dot. And uh, they're trying different things. Again, I kind of mentioned Victory Games out of New York City puts out Dr. Roos Game of Good Sex and sells 300 to 400,000 via Spencer gift stores throughout the mall all over the country in the 80s. Um, definitely paying the bills. So there you go. There were failures. But hey, Tom had nothing to do with them. <laughs> So not wanting to just focus on the failures, I had to follow that up with a quick question of Avalon Hill has produced over 230 plus games. Do you have a favorite and why? So I thought, okay, give them a little something on the, on the flip side. So Tom says, aside from football strategy, my favorite game among the Avalon Hill line, now don't forget he designed football strategy, would have been Stalingrad. Not too complicated, not too lengthy, clear-cut goals. Football strategy was called the best game ever invented by Sports Illustrated magazine in their 1961 shop walk column. Boom, and he ends it. So he had to get that in there. Had to get that in there. So other than his football strategy game, the designer, Stalingrad out of the 230 plus. But getting into games and game designers. Um, we have, so I've got my copy of Midway here. Um, designer, Larry or Lawrence Pinsky. By the way, I have reached out via email to uh, Dr. Pinsky. He's a professor, very well-renowned professor. Um, he's still teaching. He may or may not do a live show, so we'll see. He, he said uh, he doesn't want to do anything over 15 minutes. I'll take that, Larry. I'll take that, sir, doctor, Mr. Pinsky, Dr. Pinsky. I'll take that. Um, so uh, designer of this. Also, uh, I've got to remember uh, uh, Lindsley uh, Schutz. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Developer. But a cool thing with that was you had um, Pinsky and Schutz uh, who had, Schutz had worked at the company, left, but they're now going to college, and they're coming back on their summer break when they're in town, and they're working on designing games. And so you can see Tom, Avalon Hill, they're attracting passionate, passionate players, enthusiasts, designers, and you can see... Um, kind of the same thing going on even in present day. So here's Guadalcanal, and I've got these two games out because I'm going to talk about, might as well bring them on a little closer, we're going to talk about the technical advisory staff that Tom brings on. Let me flip on over here. And I'm going to put in, again, Tom sent me some uh, pictures, and he sent me a particular picture of here. I've zoomed in on it now. You're looking at it a little bit, a little bit better visually here. So first to explain technical advisors, and I think, well, let me explain the picture first because Guadalcanal will be the third time they've worked with a technical advisor. They reached out to Avalon Hill. Tom reaches out to folks that were there that knew about this specific battle 
and brings them on board in order to add to the the historical reality of the game, to give historical context to the game, knowing, I mean, I think a lot of gamers are like me, you start to read something about Guadalcanal, or maybe it's the other way around, you play the game and then it leads you into reading, but for me it would be I would read something on Guadalcanal or Midway, and then I'd be like, whoa, there's a game I can play on this as well, and kind of learn the details now, almost kind of like when you're there. Now, in this particular picture, this is 1966. You're looking at the office of Leatherneck Magazine, which is located um, near the Pentagon. Now, at the far left of the photo is Ed Adams of Sales. So he's got the little paper in his hand, and he's looking down at the game. You've got Eric Dot, who is the owner of Avalon Hill, and you can think of him as CEO. Great picture. You can kind of see... Um, I've seen photos of him at his, when he's older, so that's the youngest photo I've seen of, of Mr. Dot. And then you've got Colonel Donald Dixon. He's pointing at the map. He um, was would tell stories of battles that he was actually in. Right there he's pointing at the map, and I'm imagining he's telling, hey, I was right here, we were pushing against this group here, and this is what we had to do. And then, of course, you've got Tom Shaw, with the white shirt and the uh, thin black tie, uh, listening to what uh, the colonel is stating. Now what's really neat, we'll come back out here. Um, so Colonel Donald Dixon, USMC, has a little Leathernecks illustrated book that has some of the history inside and photos that he actually drew himself while he was over there. Um, included in the game. So you get this nice touch of the history, you get the visual aspect all tied in with the colonel who was actually there and partook in several of the fights, the battles actually on Guadalcanal. Um, you can even see his photo here at the uh, front page with uh, as we move into the rules of the game and everything. So you can see this direct tie-in between game, history, and the real folks that were there. And I'm just telling you that right off the bat, which is sure, I'm sure why they wanted to use them, them, not use them, work with them, was that you're definitely feeling like that authenticity is here. It's, it's like um, the author of a book who sits down with multiple folks that were in that battle or that ran that operation. Um, and you can definitely see the due diligence that's also going on. Now, I'll back on up here a little bit because that photo tells you a lot, but that's not the first collaboration with technical advisors that Avalon Hill does that Tom uh, works on. It starts off with Midway. So with Midway, again, a Penske game, de design game, you have Rear Admiral C. Wade McCluskey. Now, McCluskey is actually the very first American or part of this combat group. He was flying a Dauntless dive bomber to make contact with the Japanese flotilla. Hello, hello, hello. And he gives them um, kind of his version of events. And so you can see, wow, I mean, that's uh, just honestly, that's exciting when I'm doing the research for this and, and finding that out. I'm like, really? Well, that is very cool. So the next technical advisor they reach out for is for Battle of the Bulge. They reach out and make contact with General Anthony McAuliffe. Now, McAuliffe is the, the famous uh, commander that when the Germans ask for surrender during the Battle of the Bulge, he gives them one answer. You already know what it is. Nuts! <laughs> confuses the Germans. They're like, what does that mean? What is that? Of course, the Americans got it right away. No, we're not doing it. It's like a real strong up yours kind of thing. Now, at first, um, uh, McAuliffe says, I've never capitalized on my war record. I'm not going to do it now. I'm assuming Tom, it's got to be Tom. Tom sends him uh, the D-Day game from Avalon Hill. Just sends it, hey, we're working on Battle of the Bulge. Here's D-Day. Here's what we've done in the past. 
He contacts him a few weeks later, says, hey, I'd given that to my nephew. He loves it. Um, he's very impressed by, um, I think, I mean, it doesn't say exactly, but I would imagine the idea that there is a game with the historical feel, flavor, the context of it, and says, what can I do to assist? You know, I'll, I'll jump in and give some technical advice. Boom. I mean, genius. And to take it one further, during the um, spring 65 uh, promotional campaign for what Avalon Hill is going to put out, they send out packets and packets and packets of peanuts to all of the uh, buyers. So all the game stores and the bigger, the bigger uh, box stores are getting these peanuts. Nuts. <laughs> so <laughs> perfect. So while talking to different people about Avalon Hill, generally focused on the company and the game and the employees and kind of working on my knowledge and trying to work toward doing these interviews, I kept running across two things. I would hear a lot of stuff back on softball games, so all the SPI versus Avalon Hill folks and Tom being right at the forefront of that. And I would occasionally hear stuff about the farm, Tom's farm. So I was like, hmm. And then I'm talking to uh, Charlie Kibler, um, who we can go see the live show with him, which really starts this whole thing going. He's a great, great game artist, board, game board artist. I'm sure he does everything. And uh, he had mentioned some stuff at the farm, and then he even sent me some um, color photos that he had. You're, you're going to see those as we will see where I plug these in, but you'll see just some pictures, and even Tom was in one where he's greeting folks as they show up at the farm. So I had a question for Tom uh, in reference to the farm, and uh, just curious to see where it would go. I've heard stories about company days at your farm in Maryland. What were those? Tom says a few, quote, company days, end quote, occurred on my 13-acre farm in Hides in northeast Baltimore County. Wife Christy reminded me we once sponsored a feast of steamed Maryland crabs. Wow. See, that's, this is the kind of stuff that, as a kid, I was wishing I could just, hey, I'm here, here for the, the crab feast. <laughs> There were also a few softball games among Monarch employees played on the recreation field adjacent to my farm. So interesting that there's a softball diamond or a baseball diamond that uh, happens to just be adjacent to Tom's farm. That can't be a, co a coincidence. Um, so, I mean, there's the simple answer to that. There were a few company days that occurred out there and even a big steamed Maryland crab feast. Mm. So the photo's been coming up. I was just kind of explaining that. You can even see the young Alan Moon. I, I'm, I just love that stuff. Uh, everybody's got to remember there were no cell phone cameras back then. So you took some shots with your camera. Hopefully they came out good and you got what you got. <laughs> so then a little bit harder question. I wanted to kind of come in with the farm and see what, see what we can get there. But then um, a little harder question for Tom. You took early retirement in 1992, staying on part-time as a consultant until 1996. Why did you leave in 92? And what was your major consulting duties that you were doing basically from 92 to 96? I retired in 1992 at age 62. Why? Because son Jackson Dot, so this is Eric Dot's son, was being groomed for my job and I was left with very little creative work to do. My time uh, from 1992 through 1996, so this is the part where he's consulting, was a one day a week appearance to qualify for company paid medical insurance. There was no real consulting on my part. So that explains even when I've had some folks from Avalon Hill say that, that started after 92, that they kind of saw Tom every once in a while, but they didn't know quite what, you know, what he was involved with. So they were just kind of seeing him. Um, and that clears that up. 
immediately. So talking to Tom as I was setting this interesting interview style up, I knew Tom was living um, in the villages in Florida. And I thought, okay, I, my sister lives in Tampa, so other than the sun and the obvious attraction of the villages, which I didn't know much about, what gets you to leave the farm in Maryland and come down to Florida? So I asked Tom specifically, kind of shifting at this point, away from Avalon Hill and kind of where is Tom right now? And I ask, you and your wife, Christy, retired to the villages in 2001. At age 81, according to your book, you're playing bridge, you're still cartooning. Remember, he was doing that all the way back in the, uh, in the Army playing golf, and you won nine gold medals in pickleball. Now, I'm going to come back to pickleball in a bit, but let me continue. You also wrote a book, which is Confessions of an 84-Year-Old Teenager. It would now be 90-Year-Old Teenager if he were to do a uh, follow-up second version of the book. And we're playing mandolin in your band, and I'm going to come back to the band in a little bit too, called The Last Time Out. This sounds like my kind of retirement. And quite honestly, well, hold on, sorry. We'll get to my quite honestly in a second. Do you believe staying active has been the secret to your longevity? Again, he's 90 years old right now. And is all the activity in the villages what motivated you to move off your farm? Tom's answer, yes. The lifestyle offered in the villages was the great motivator for our move south. That and the burden of increasing maintenance on the farm. Good point. Everything's always in decay. At age 90, his current age right now, I'm as active as possible under the circumstances. Healthy as a bear. <laughs> Love it. So as I'm reading Tom's continued sports athleticism with pickleball, which I'm reading in his book, I kept thinking, what is pickleball? I just didn't know what pickleball was. So I'm talking at work. Some of you know I'm in the law enforcement realm. And we have a guy named Stark. I'm going to bring Stark on right now. He's kind of the jack of all trades sport, maybe even of everything. He's been nicknamed by me, the commander, because when he says something, it's authoritative. That is very true. I uh, tend to come off that way. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. I asked Stark if he would come on. I gave you a little bit of brief history on uh, Thomas Shaw. Yeah. Um, and then I had some general... Uh, I didn't even know you were going to be a semi-pickleball aficionado. Well, sports are my thing. So <laughs> anything sports. So we're just chatting. I'm like, yeah, Tom is, you know, at least when the book's written, he's 84 and he's down in the villages in Florida, and he's playing pickleball, and he's winning championships. And I think Stark says something like, well, part of pickleball, though, you got to make sure you stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> One of the very unique things about pickleball. I'm like, stay out of the kitchen? Wait till you hear what it is. Yeah, I'm like, what are you talking about? What is a kitchen? Who has a sport that has a kitchen? I go, and then I go, what is pickleball? And so you agreed to come on, and I asked you to even bring some stuff. So explain to me, because I've intentionally not learned about pickleball, because I wanted you sure. to kind of explain to me and to everybody okay. else. So pickleball originated in 1965 up in Seattle, uh, just outside of Seattle, by three dads, because they ran out of things to do during the summertime for their kids. There's the normal sports, but this is just in their backyard. This is so something you could just pick up. We're talking three dads and... They ran out of stuff to do with their kids. Yeah. So, so they invent this as a kid kind of thing. Yeah. They started out just as okay. let's whack a ball back and forth over a piece of cardboard, basically. Hmm. So now it's evolved into pickleball. Pickleball now is played on badminton court, which Can is I, 20 by 44. Of I'm course. touch this. <laughs> so this is a pickleball. It's similar to a wiffle ball, just a little heavier, designed to fly over the net. You can hit it hard and it ain't going to fly very far. And then it's designed with a um, hard paddle, and then you hit it over the net. The net's the same size as a tennis court, um, height and width. It's the same size as a tennis court. Just the, the net, net part. Yeah. Okay, the net. The is. court itself is played on 20 foot by 44 foot 
court. Okay. The unique part about pickleball is what we discussed: the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> so a kitchen necessarily is a no volley area. So you can't volley. A volley is where you hit it in the air without it bouncing. It's three and a half feet on each side, so seven foot total, right in the center. It's designed for people of your stature, so you can't just stand at the net and spike it right down on the person that hits it over the net. Got it. I'm 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, correct. So Got you can it. just stand at the net and reach everything that I comes to you. Make sure I don't hit the ceiling. So Got pickleball it. is a great game for everybody. My 5-year-old can play, and obviously a 90-year-old can play as well. Hmm. You can usually play it in doubles, but you can play singles as well. Singles is just a little more difficult because it's more ground to cover. Okay. Um, there's a few rules that you have to know about. You ha can't let it bounce before you serve it, so you have to serve it underhand and you have to hit it over the net you serve diagonally just like tennis but yeah, there's a two bounce rule so when you hit it over the net they have to let it bounce and then when they hit it back over the net the server has to let it bounce hmm. so you can't play it in the air until it's bounced on each side once, once. and okay. then it's free game now i think you also said it's almost like a cross between like ping pong and badminton yes okay so, i'll let you continue there's, there's about three so tennis it originated with tennis in mind because it has the tennis net tennis you play it on a tennis court but it's still the smaller court um and then ping pong because it's not a full swing you're only playing on a small court so it's more of a flick and the hard paddle comes from ping pong so you're just pretty much flicking the wrist to get the ball to go over the net quickly and then badminton i mean who knows like badminton, but it's just a, sure. a, a, it's a lighter float. It's a lighter, lighter float, and you hit it hard, and it doesn't go as far. So it's the same concept. So those three are what they originated it behind. And then you actually intrigued me when you said, unlike tennis, there's not as much lateral movement, so it's easier on your knees. Correct. This is why you, they've started putting these in, say, the newer communities and the retirement communities, because instead of tennis, tennis has a huge court, your side-to-side -side lateral moments, you're stopping, going, stopping, going. And I'm terrible at yes. it. Yes. Badminton and doubles, you really only have half the court to cover, and you're looking at like nine feet, and you can almost reach that just by sidestepping once. Hmm. So it's easy for older generations to play because they can just hit it back and forth and they don't have to worry about the movement quite as much and it's easier on the knees. And then you also had me intrigued. Not only did you say that tennis courts, which quite honestly in Wichita, Kansas, you don't see them used very often. Correct. So you said they were being converted and then you said you can show up. And this reminds me of 1980s arcade. Yes. Arcades in general. You come up, a couple people are playing. You said you throw your paddle in this little cylinder thing. Yep. And it basically means you got the next game with the okay. winner. So I, I, I relate it back to pool. I grew up playing pool. You put your quarter up, you're the next person to play pool. Similar to pickleball. You show up. There are reserve courts, but most of them are open play. That's what they call them. You go up, you stick your paddle in a little PVC cylinder, and you're the next up, and then the game continues to flow. That way everybody gets to play. Now, before we finish, because you got to cover the kitchen again, there was something where your momentum can carry you into the kitchen, but you can't just like camp out in the kitchen. Right. So it's designed so you can't stand at the net and camp and just hit the ball over every time. Okay. So the, the three and a half feet, you can be outside of that and you can play it in the air all day long. It's basically, it's where you want to get to when you're playing a match because you have the advantage if you're closer to the net. However, if you're at the net, you can't play it in that three and a half foot. But if your momentum carries you into it, so you're running towards the net and they hit it over and it lands in the kitchen and you go to play it, if you go into the kitchen, you can hit it. But you got to get back out of the kitchen before you can play the next shot. Yeah, there's a lot of in the kitchen, out of the kitchen. Yeah. Well, part of it, I even then imagine you could do a little baby hit into the kitchen, so they've got to be able to run momentum wise into the kitchen to return it. Yep. And, and then, because then, okay. you want to be close to cut down the angle. Got it. Anything else you want to add in? That's like, it's a great game. If you haven't played it, get out there and play it. All right. You have to wear a headband. I like them, but you don't have to. <laughs> uh, I believe pickleball may be the new rage because... It's coming on strong. And it sounds like kids can play it all the way up to nine-year-olds. Yep. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. For coming on. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. All right. Thank you. Starks in, Starks out. I want to play pickleball. I... I tried tennis was terrible all the lateral movement uh the the uh control of the racket with the wrist to getting the hits it was horrible this pickleball looks fun first of all anything that children and 90 year old tom shaw can play i can get in on at the age of 50 and i need i need a little bit of activity away from both screen time and board game time i need some physical get the heart rate going we're going to see how that goes. I'll report back to you on pickleball. So, Tom, I think you might have me started down the pickleball road here. Now, near the end of this video, 
I'm going to just touch on, I think, I think I'll only pick two. Uh, two little segments out of Tom's books. Book, not books. Maybe books, but out of his individual book. He's hilarious. So before this show interview ends, I'm going to just read you a couple little snip snippets that I've dog-eared in his book that are a riot. Um, I would imagine hanging out with Tom is a hoot. So, but let's go into some more questions here because um, I'm getting close to the end. But, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about what Tom's doing in the villages. All right, so another little sidebar question here. And Tom has authorized me to give out his email in case anyone wants to directly correspond uh, with him. But when I proposed this question, I wasn't sure if he would want that public or not. So we'll get to his full email address a little bit later. But in this question... I say Mando Tom is part of your email address. Again, the rest of that will come up at the end so you can correspond if you wish. When I first saw this, I got Star Wars excited. <laughs> okay, so I love Star Wars. I was like, Mando Tom, mm, big fan of the Mandalorian on Disney. Uh, I got the Star Wars excited and thought you must be a big fan of the new Disney TV show about the bounty hunting Mandalorian, who goes by the name Mando. After chatting with you, however, I suspect the name has more to do with you playing the mandolin. Do tell. So you can see I'm getting a little cheeky in my uh, questions here as well. And again, stay with us. He um, has authorized me to release his email, which I'll do. So Tom says, correct. It personifies the new email address, which he adopted. He says, adopted when performances of our band, last time, spelled T-Y-M-E, out, had become so much in demand, it was almost like work. Now, I'm throwing some photos up here of the band because it goes into my second question in regards to the band as well. So you're going to see some of these photos flashing around. Um, I think you'll see Tom with his mandolin in there, along with the other fellas. So is your Villages band, the last time out, Bluegrass band, but you don't play Bluegrass, that's their own kind of little catchphrase there, the first band you've been a member of? An Army newspaper article, so he had included this in his packet, I believe is where I saw that, says you play several instruments and even sing. Hello. What other instruments are we talking about here, and can you still carry a tune? Uh, Tom says, never played in a professional band prior to moving to the villages. So look at this. In retirement, in the villages, boom, professional band career starts for Tom. However, Tom says, played acoustic Martin guitar and Gibson mandolin early on. Was never a lead singer, but filled in occasionally, I don't know why I'm laughing there, on high vocal harmony. See, you're way better than me. I can't do any harmony. My amateur group, Delaney Valley Boys, entertained in homes gratis. That means free. <laughs> Only two members of the six-man band, oh, are still above band, uh, uh, still above ground. So the Delaney Valley Boys, uh, only two members of the six-man band are still above ground, both playing professionally till now. My 90-year-old arthritic fingers can still hit the G, C, D chord system with flourish. With flourish. Emphasis is mine. <laughs> Love it. This is what I'm talking about. I would have asked him this and seen if we could get into some of that that uh, that this banter back and forth, but I still love what's going on with the questions here. Now, I sent him 20 questions. I sent Tom 20 questions, and I tell him that I'm cheating on this, this last one. Using your book and my, re my own research, I've established a list of managers slash employees of Avalon Hill. A list, mind you. Could you provide a quick description, I didn't want to wear them out here, of them from your point of view and share a story or two about them? 
Feel free to skip anyone that you don't have enough information to talk about. So, I mean, I, I threw in names here all over. Also, if I've missed someone important, please add them in. Now, the list is quite extensive. I think I've got 20-some folks on here. And um, what I'm going to do then is just slide to um, Tom's answers. Lindsley Schutz was full-time design and playtest assistant during Robert's regime. So he was Tom's assistant. Also through great batting practice on adjacent diamond during lunch hours with a big old exclamation point. During Monarch early days, so Monarch Avalon, that's how we're, we're moving into the future here, Schutz, again, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, sir, worked part-time during his summer break from post-grad studies. We talked about that with Midway and uh, several other games. Assisted Larry Pinsky, again, on design of Midway, Blitzkrieg, and Guadalcanal. So I don't have Blitzkrieg. That was a non-historical game. I actually feel like I need to get it. Um, and let's see, did this for about three summers. So for three summers, they were coming in and working through their summer vacation. An excellent game player. So Lins Linsley Schutz was on my list. All of these folks will be folks on the list, or he'll tell you when he's adding someone. Larry Pinsky. Worked part-time summers perfecting Midway, Blitzkrieg, Battle of the Bulge, and Guadalcanal. Brilliant chap. Had his eye on becoming an astronaut. And he's now a renowned physics, uh, doctoral physics expert, I believe, with gravity. And famous in that realm. Hopefully. Come on, Larry. Come on the show, sir. <laughs> Eric Dot. So Eric, again, was the, uh, was the owner and then like CEO as it moves into Monarch. Had, a, had I not convinced Dot to take over Avalon Hill and stay with it, I might still be writing humorous Muppets commercials. Sounds like that would have been fun too. Good working relationship at start. Financial decisions were his alone. He needs, and then there's a break here, so I'm assuming, and trusted no one. He needs and trusted no one. Son Jackson couldn't buy a stamp without his father's approval. Dot opened all the mail himself. He even mentions back when he was working on the south side of Dot's desk that if there was uh, mail coming in and it had a check, boom, Dot grabbed that. So <laughs> that was what he handled. Even separating the mail orders, yep, here we go, removing cash and coins himself, okay? Employees were asked to do personal things for him, uh, even to babysitting his granddaughters. Hmm. I must confess my relationship with Eric soured during my final five years due to personality conflicts, which kicked in a bit of paranoia. Jackson Dot, and I would love to have Jackson Dot on the show. I believe he's in his mid to late 60s now. Enjoyed his presence, was an intensely interested, sorry, was as intensely interested in baseball as I was. He threw great batting practice too, ultimately groomed for my job, which was executive vice president. His first duty under fire was overseeing microcomputer games. So Avalon Hill was really early in on trying to convert their board games into computer games, kind of seeing the future there. But I know as I was playing in the 80s, it wasn't quite there yet. It wasn't working. So microcomputer games, uh, Jackson was overseeing a division set up in 1980 in Glenarm, Maryland, six miles away from the home office at 4517 Hartford Road. Failure of this group was due to an due to underfinancing, lack of input from Greenwood's designers, they were not allowed there, and poor grasp of the intricacies of the new technology itself. Very interesting. And again, Jackson, Mr. Dot, if you're watching this, I would love to have you come on the show. 
Stephen, and I'll mess up your name, sir. S S Z E K E L Y, Zakelly, my production coordinator. First at J E Smith, then as a full-time Monarch employee. We worked well together, especially when demand exceeded supply of top-selling games. I love that. So demand of top-selling games was exceeded. They didn't have enough printed. Sounds like Steven would get in there and get the presses fired up. Helen Michael, Roberts's sister. Hmm. I didn't know that. A sweet gal. As Amazon women go, <laughs> she must have been a big gal. <laughs> now, Mark, Mark Herman did say Tom's a tiny fella, so I don't know which way this will go. But Helen handled all shipping from day one. Left to give birth, but not until her pregnant condition was immortalized as the, quote, Michael's bend, end quote, on the Blitzkrieg game map. Very cool. As an aside... Most all Blitzkrieg map contours had special personal uh, meanings. Rivers were named after Avalon Hill sales reps. The desert was named um, after the great Koufax Desert because it was so sandy. <laughs> all right, move to Don Greenwood. Hello, the famous Don Greenwood hiring him. My greatest business decision. No need to dwell on his accomplishments, which everyone watching this should be familiar with. Yes, I think so. What's not known is his con contribution to the good health of yours truly when he introduced me to racquetball. So there you go. There's where I got the racquetball story. We engaged in combat, that's quoted, many, many mornings prior to work at the Townsend College Courts and Downtown Athletic Club. Now again, hopefully, hopefully, Mr. Greenwood will uh, do a live show or we can do the same system I'm doing here, whatever. I think, I think getting Don Greenwood's take on Avalon Hill is the best live I could get in terms of the Avalon Hill history. Nothing against you, Tom. Nothing against you. You said that yourself. <laughs> Randy Reed, my first design employee, first working from home, answering the Q&A correspondence we called, quote, nut mail, end quote, that eventually developed into a full-time job at my office on Guilford Avenue in Midtown, Baltimore. Uh, Randy became heavy in the design of war games, um, too numerous to mention here. So caught up in accuracy, so caught up in accuracy of Richthofen's war, great World War I uh, biplane, triplane war game. He risked life, he risked life and limb taking a 30 minute flight in a Stearman World War I biplane at the flying. Circus Aerodrome in Bealton, Virginia. Hmm. I opted to watch from the ground. Randy's work ethics were beyond compare. James Dunnigan, also known as Jim Dunnigan, <laughs> first met Jim in our New York toy and game showroom around 1967. Posing as a reporter, he was in reality picking my brains regarding war game design. Subsequently, he took me up on my offer to design Jutland for the grand total, wait for this, of $200. Woo. <laughs> now, that was paid in installments even. Sorry. $200 paid in installments. I don't want to ad lib Tom here. As uh, Charlie Kibler pointed out, Dot was never big on overpaying for services rendered. Hmm. Since our initial meeting, relations with Dunnigan had always been courteous and respectful, even as competitors. Jim had his own design studio. So um, they worked so well together. There were even some designs that started um, with Jim's company and then came over to Avalon Hill. 
Mark Herman. Now, some of you have seen my interview with Mark. Please go watch that if you haven't. It's uh, it's long. It's about two hours, but a lot of cool information. Uh, very prolific game designer, both in and away from SPI. So SPI was uh, where he'd worked before he uh, comes over and does Victory Games. So accomplished, Dot put Herman in charge of Victory Games. The SPI offshoot, Monarch Avalon, took over. Maintaining an office in Manhattan, New York. A prolific softball power hitter. Boom. Uh, Avalon Hill outfielders moved back to the railroad tracks when he came to bat in the Avalon Hill SPI softball games. Now, again, that was a reference to my question. And if you go watch the interview with Mark, he talks about how um, Tom was super fast and ran down what should have been a home run if there had been a wall or a fence. But it, he chased his his uh, home run fly all the way into the parking lot and caught it. <laughs> Lou Zachi. Hopefully that's correct pronunciation. As mentioned earlier, Lou became a dyed-in-the-wool Avalon Hill aficionado from almost day one. His first correspondence was the, quote, perfect train schedule, end quote, he had perfected when playing dispatcher. Roberts' third game Avalon Hill game in the early days. Ultimately, he ran a game design and distribution company titled GameSense. Still in business today. Hmm. That's G-A-M-E-S-C-E-N-C-E. -E -E, GameSense. Lou is one of my favorite remaining hobby friends. Lou, be reaching out to your brother. <laughs> I would love to have you on the show. Rex Martin an outstanding writer, took over the general in 1982 from Greenwood, who had edited 60 issues after my nine years at the helm, an excellent editor being familiar and having played many Avalon Hill games. He was even good at bridge. Bridge. Gene Bayer, Although not on your list, so I did not have Gene on my list, Gene was Dot's lone artist back in the pre-Avalon Hill days. During the rebirth, she handled much board box troop counter art and illustrations until Kibler's arrival and Greenwood's use of talented Roger McGowan, whom I never personally met. Now, this is interesting. If you watch Charlie Kibler's interview, he mentions... Gene, I believe. He talks about how um, in the great campaigns of the American Civil War, there were a couple, I believe that's what it was, there were a couple maps that were just not good as far as their color and layout. And he went back and fixed those when they were done by uh, MMP, I believe. But uh, I think that's what's referenced there. Brooks Robinson, another not on your list, but important cog in promotion of Avalon Hill sports games. During his final season with the Baltimore Orioles, 1977, he became a sales rep for our entire sports line, and I've put in the little promotional flyer that Tom included in a packet so you can see how his services were used. At every city the Orioles were scheduled in, I lined him up for a personal appearance. Sorry, I lined him up for personal appearances and autograph signing at local toy and game stores. The deal was, for every hour of Brooks's time, the outlet had to order a gross, which is 144 games, of sports games. Dot printed up quantities of Robinson's photos, which I delivered to him at his modest home in Timonium, Maryland. Hmm. And I believe the shot that I've put up here, I don't know, maybe, or maybe that's not it, but that was definitely involved in that promotion. Tom put down others. Growing pains in 1978 uh, necessitated the move from Guilford Avenue to 20th East Reed Street, located between 900 Block North Charles and St. Paul Streets in Midtown Baltimore. Designers came and went, working under Greenwood's tutelage. I had very little contact with the design staff other than managing them for the softball games to come versus SPI. Hmm. 
Very cool. Tom's email address, if you want to ask him any follow-up questions. Um, also, you can put some of those down in the comments. Uh, he plans on watching this. He's actually asking me, hey, when are you going to get it out? Is mandotom88 at gmail.com. I've put that up on the screen here, and it's M-A-N-D-O-T-O-M, the numerals 88, at gmail.com. Mandotom88 at gmail.com. Dot com. Now, before I step totally away from the interview process, I also asked um, some folks that I'd interviewed kind of in reference to Avalon Hill. Now, Dan Masterson runs Strategy Page and Strategy Talk, and you can even see my videos there. So they're posting my videos there. And Dan also loves this history. So I asked him and J.C. Connors, who was present in 1998 working for Avalon Hill, when Eric Dot fires everybody because it's been sold to Hasbro. So Dan says, two questions come to mind, which we will be exploring with Jim from the SPI side. One, how did Jim Dunnigan convince Tom to do the Jutland game? it being so different from anything they had done before then. So Tom's answer to that first question is, when meeting Dunnigan for the first time, my need for new designs required, quote, any port in a storm, end quote. I simply took a chance that he knew what he was talking about. What did I have to lose, okay? So there you go, any port in a storm, what did he have to lose? Come on, Jim, give me a design. Two, the coopetition between SPI and Avalon Hill. Avalon Hill reprinted around half a dozen SPI games and several original games by Jim. Panzer Army Africa, Panzer Group uh, Guderian, and Conquistador examples of the former. Origins of World War II and Outdoor Adventure examples of the latter. Panzer Blitz falls into a special category all of its own as it was derived from a test series game by SBI called Tactical Game 3. So answer to two was cooperation, of course he calls it coopetition, uh, but Tom calls it cooperation between Avalon Hill and SPI was exceedingly friendly from his, he says, from my standpoint. So he was all in. Uh, it was all just about cooperation. So JC had a question. Today there are hundreds of times more professional game designers versus when Tom was designing games. What advice would Tom give to a young game designer? He has a second one to follow up to that. But first, Tom says, my advice to budding young game designers is to make sure there is competition and that winning slash losing flow goes back and forth. And number two, was there a game Tom worked on that he just couldn't get right and was never released. He says he was he he is thinking of Ninja and some of the ones that he worked on while he was at Avalon Hill that never quite worked out. Uh, he said these are usually great stories, you know, kind of what were the problems, where was the roadblock. So uh, Tom's answer to number two, JC's second question: I don't recall a game I worked on that was never released because I couldn't get it right. <laughs> so Tom could get it right, JC. He got him right. <laughs> All right, so my final thoughts uh, here about my interview with Tom. First of all, Tom, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Um, just being able to converse with you back and forth uh, over email uh, was fabulous. And uh, you know, my wife saw me working through, how was I going to narrow this down to 20 questions? Um, um, what was going to be my framework? Was it just going to be Avalon Hill? And I quickly decided, no way. We've got to work in your, your pre-life, you know, the Army, the baseball, of course, your, your athletics all the way through, Avalon Hill, and then even into the villages. The villages was fun. So your spirit of living 
is phenomenal. And I'm so glad I was able to uh, get in contact with you. And a thanks goes out to your nephew, and I'm sorry I didn't have his name in, the, uh, in my notes here, but I will find it and I'll place it up here because I was able to get in contact with him via internet searching, and then he was able to finally link us up. So a, a big thanks to him and a big thanks to you uh, for your time. Um, so I will tell you, um, both Tom and everybody watching, kind of the, the whole thing that gets me excited about doing these Avalon Hill interviews is it definitely takes me back to me when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And I had this mythical feeling of what it would be like to work at Avalon Hill and to have all of these games and to know what's coming and, and be play testing with the group. I mean, I can see why um, all these uh, young guys were, you know, Pinsky are taking breaks uh, on their or on their they're on their summer break and they're coming to Avalon Hill to uh, play test and design, um, you know, and and that's kind of where I had this this mythical image of what Avalon Hill was, um, and so for me going back and 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 getting to know individuals and stories and kind of see. The workings, and of course, in my adult age, I'm 50 now. You know, I, I knew that uh, it's work. It's work behind the scenes, and it's uh, struggles, and and it's visions, and and uh, it's a roll of the dice sometimes on what goes on. So, but that's why I um, continued this series. It's why I really wanted to interview Tom. Um, and that's why I hope to continue to interview folks that worked at Avalon Hill in whatever, in whatever part um, as this series goes forward. So first, anyone out there, if you happen to be watching and you worked at Avalon Hill and you're willing to do, uh, I prefer live interviews just because that interaction back and forth and you, you end up discovering things and you can go down rabbit trails. But barring that, um, uh, I will do um, interviews that work out like this, or if I can just do them over the, uh, over the phone on speaker, I'll do that. I really want to not only do the discovery myself, but it also feels like I'm laying down, and maybe this is grandiose on my part, but I'm laying down some, some information that will be there and be available and kind of lock some of these stories in time. Maybe grandiose on my part. The other thing that I I kind of kept I kept thinking, how would I end this? Um, because it was definitely my thirteen teen year teenage self that was was tapped back into as I did this interview. But I was also thinking as I was working with Tom, what's kind of the underlying current other than his gaming that that you know, the way he could game a situation and push through. But it also is the kind of the Stoics way of the obstacle is the way. Um, Avalon Hill's going into bankruptcy, and uh, Tom says it clearly in his one answer, hey, I, I didn't want to be unemployed. But he takes that file folder of customers, a lot of which were errata questions coming in that built up this this base and uh, he could see these fans there. And then he's able to go to Eric Dot, who is a businessman, a money guy. And he's not looking to just throw money away, but he's like, look at this customer base, look at the fans that are here. And then Tom taking what was an obstacle and turning it into a big opportunity, a place that he works at for upwards of 32 plus years. Not to mention, um, you know, Eric Dot goes in and using oftentimes other people's money, but he's able to keep this company going, keep it profitable, and even eventually sell it to Hasbro. So saying the obstacle is the way is just, I think you can always see, or sometimes it's better to see opportunity when you're faced with a problem rather than just a wall or a barrier. Because out of Charles Roberts bankruptcy comes the Avalon Hill that most of us actually 
think of from this Q&A with Tom and from me reading and studying Tom's history, um, I learned that the Avalon Hill I know was the Avalon Hill that started to be built, you know, in 65 plus all the way through into the heyday, into the acquisition of all these 230 plus titles, even some of the 3M stuff. But the main core being games, because one of my mottos is, is that um, I love history and the games, especially Avalon Hill and Victory Games and GMT and a lot of the other ones out there, allow me to play. They make history my playground. So don't forget, the obstacle is the way. And uh, for everybody out there, go check out Confessions of an 84-Year-Old Teenager if you want to dive much deeper. I just touched on a few things in that book. Oh, I said I would cover a couple very, very funny things. Let me do that real quick from his book before we leave. Just a couple. All right, so I grabbed the book. Now, again, you can see what's going on here, but I want to cover two funny little passages that will give you Tom's spirit in a page. All right, so duplicate bridge is something Tom was playing at or does play at the villages. Now first he references that the rules for duplicate bridge are more complicated than most of those rules for Avalon Hill games. So that tells you something already. And then he talks about how basically there's a referee and teams he's playing against are calling over referees and calling them into question for maybe a clearing of your throat or a dropping of uh, some spilled cards in a bidding box, all kinds of things. But here's one of the best parts. Neighbor and bridge player Biddy Rhodes, who is a retired nurse, has some duplicate players on her quote, do not resuscitate list. <laughs> so anybody that's played enough board games, I think, is like Biddy. And as some folks, whether they're a nurse or not, themselves on a do not, a DNR, a do not resuscitate list. So there were things as I'm reading through Tom's book where I just had to pause and was just laughing out loud. Even at 84 when this is written, but I'm sure even at 90, the joy in which he's able to pass on his sense of humor is great. Now, I won't read it directly. I don't think I can find it, but it had to do with um, winning some pickleball games or championships based on sometimes the, uh, the opponent in your championship tier passed away suddenly. So you advanced automatically. <laughs> I'm like... I've seen that same kind of gallows humor uh, with cops. I see it all the time. It actually keeps, uh, in my opinion, a person sane, and it keeps life fun and interesting. So I can't say enough of uh, uh, confessions of an 84-year-old teenager. Again, it's not just Avalon Hill, but it will be the best dive into Avalon Hill you could do um, based on uh, Tom's perspective of uh, of his working in and around the company. So again, thank you for your time. Um, this took a lot of work to get together, and I know it's a little bit longer than my average shows. Hopefully you found value in it. And Tom, hopefully you like it. Thank you again for your time, sir. All right, see you guys later. Game on!